motion to call the Johnson City Council work session number 24-3 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Cope? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Burkhart? Here. Evans? We will have one agenda item this evening, and that is a discussion of the FY 2024-25 budget. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I just have a few things that I sent out this afternoon. I will go through pretty quickly. I do apologize for sending it out late, but this is some additional items we added into board docs. Um, we did include in budget overview and the charts and additional budget documents. Um, both in the PDF version and then if you go to the last chart, uh, there was a request for a list of where the loss proceeds would be proposed that were going to go into the general operation budget. And so that is in, in there now. Um, certainly, I know this is look at it. If you have issues or concerns, back to us. Uh, we can discuss it at the next uh, city council meeting also. Um, but, the, but there is a list of how we would propose the uh, dollars that we'll be transferring out of local option sales tax into the general operating budget, uh, what those all will go towards. Um, additionally, under departments, there was a request uh, to include the handout uh, that Chief Clark included. So when you go to public safety and the oops, Johnson Grimes Fire Department, uh, under the section that's uh, budget changes from the previous fiscal year, uh, you'll see his note page there. Um, it also was in the email attachment that was sent out. So that's there. Um, kind of the, the big items, there was a request at one of the meetings to include a breakdown of both total costs. This would be wages and benefits of the new positions that were not funded in fiscal year 2025 that were part of the five-year staffing plan and then the positions that will be in the 2026 um, staffing plan. So if you look under looking ahead, FY 25-26, uh, we did include two charts now that break those positions down. Um, you can see total cost, general fund allocation, general fund cost, and then what the levy impact would be for each of those positions. So the first table is those four positions that were in the staffing plan or fiscal year 2025 that were not included in the budget. And then the second table is the six uh, positions uh, that are in the fiscal year 2026 in the five-year staffing plan. Um, the last set of uh, information, uh, this is in the property values and levy rate section of the budget book. Um, we added two new sections in here um, and it is partway down. One is a section called financial flexibility. And this was some information we had discussed about how much could we raise the levy rates um, and uh, what's the maximum we could raise them under our legal authority. So Mike, so this is in the budget overview. And budget overview, and it's in the section that says property values and levy rate. Okay. I, I also, if you just want to look at the email that I sent out this <laughs> afternoon, it's all detailed there too. Um, so the financial flexibility section, you know, we could raise the levy additional 73 cents. Um, and as staff looked at it, I know at our last budget workshop, there was a discussion uh, of, you know, what could we raise that? And we went back and really re-verified everything. And so this is a lot lower than what uh, was reported at that budget workshop. Uh, but we can raise an additional 73 cents. That would be the cap we can do. And then you can see in the liability port, uh, property insurance costs, we can do 32 cents. Employee benefits, we can increase an additional 40 cents. And then to support the emergency management agency, uh, a little less than a penny. Uh, franchise fees, I also highlight that starting in fiscal year 2026. Uh, we could increase it from our current 1% to 5% and then each additional 1%, we're being told by Mid-American Energy would generate 344,000. We did today just receive our first 
quarterly payment from MidAmerican Energy. We went back and asked some questions because it is, uh, if you extrapolate it out, it'd be about $100,000 left. But my first question is, does that represent the uh, schools and Camp Dodge that we uh, exempted till July 1st of 2024? That would be my guess where the difference is, but we wanna get that information from MidAmerican Energy. So we've, we've asked that question of them. Um, and then I, we also included this future concerns related to assist the city's financial flexibility as we look outward. So first would be the levy adjustments or the ratcheting under House File 718. Uh, there's an annual ratcheting that occurs. PFM's done some projections looking out to 2028 uh, and based on their projections in 2026 next year. So our current um, uh, adjusted city general fund levy rate uh, maximums 820, so it'd be under what we're allowed to go up to in fiscal year 2025. In 2026, they're projecting that will go to $8.04. 2027, because we'll remain under the 3% growth cap, we can float back up to 810, so that's what that shows. And then under 2028, because of the growth they're projecting, we'll actually be pushed down to $7.86. So you can see what that ratcheting does and the, the variance that occurs. Now, under the legislation, I would note in fiscal year 2029, if there is nothing to change the legislation, which I would suspect uh, property tax bills usually come up every year or every other year, um, that that will be able to float back up to A10 and remain static. But I would guess uh, the legislature, legislature will, will change something uh, to affect that. Um, moving on to the business property tax credit re reimbursement. Uh, so this was created in 2022, and this is where the first $150,000 of commercial property taxes um, is set at the residential rollback rate. Um, currently, as you know, commercial properties are at 90%. The residential rollback uh, right now is a, is a little bit below 50%. Um, and so the state set aside $125 million in a standing appropriation bill that they would fully fund that. Now the legislation they acknowledged by uh, through a legislative service agency bill note uh, noted that by 2029 that 125 million wouldn't fully fund it. Uh, we just received word um, a little bit ago from the Department of Management that that is now uh, the case for fiscal year 2025 that that will not be fully funded and actually will only fund 71 percent of their obligation. Um, so. For, for Johnston, that credit represents about a 10 cent increase uh, in our levy or, or impacts our levy by 10 cents because we receive, uh, it's $176,000. So to generate that, we would need about a 10 cent increase in our levy. Um, with the uh, reduction, basically losing 29%, that's about a three cent impact to our overall levy rate. Um, commercial uh, property tax backfill, um, we, in next fiscal year, will receive $200,000. That's being phased out. Uh, so there's two more years in that phase out. As that phase out, um, that last $200,000, that's about 11 cent increase or 11 cent impact to our actual overall levy. Um, we did um, on those last two with the business property tax credit reimbursement and the backfill, uh, we, we did project pretty close to what we thought we'd receive in those two, um, but we're, we're short in the overall preliminary budget right now of about $12,000, uh, which is about 0.7 cents on our levy uh, of an impact. So there's gonna be, need to be some adjustments for that uh, now that we have the information from the Department of Management. The last item I would highlight is the expansion of some of our credits in particular with the senior housing um, homestead credit and the uh, military credit. Uh, those credits for Johnston for exempt properties, we went from about a million dollars in fiscal year 2024 to 7.4 million in 2025. Um, and we know there's two things that are gonna be happening with those credits. First of all, not every senior signed up. So what Polk County did is they actually used voter registration to try to identify the seniors and the properties they own. So if they could match a name with an address, so it had the exact name match with the exact address, they would then take that date of birth and apply it to the property. So there's a number of seniors that those didn't match up. If there was a trust involved, and so it was showing some living trust, that would have created uh, So some seniors weren't identified, so we anticipate that that number will grow. 
Additionally, the credit initially in 2025 is 300 or $3,250. That's going to increase to 6,500. So it's going to double next year. So that will increase it. So conservatively, you could expect that our exemptions will increase another $6 million. So for fiscal year um, 2026, <clears throat> we would anticipate that that would, would necessitate a levy rate increase of about five cents. So as you look at all of these kind of future issues, we know with flexibility, um, as we noted earlier, that's about 73 cents on the levy. Well, the ratcheting is gonna cause 34 cent impact. The property, uh, business property tax credit reimbursement is gonna be about seven cents. The commercial property tax backfill that's being phased out over the next two years is 11 cents. And the expansion and credits for both our senior um, homestead credit and our military is about another four cents as we look outward. Uh, so that's a that's an additional 57 cents that will impact our overall flexibility. Uh, so really remaining flexibility after fiscal year 2027 will actually drop to about 16 cents uh, of what we have today. So it, it's an area that we have to be very mindful of. We still have a lot of flexibility. There's no huge concern today, but it's something we got to be mindful as we move forward. I have a question. Um, before HF 718 was approved late in the 2023 leg legislative session, and that's where they uh, put these caps on growth uh, for cities. Was there always caps? I, I, I don't recall. So um, in, there's different buckets of levies. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that Johnston typically used was the 810, so that's capped at $8.10. That's our general fund levy. Uh, we also had an emergency levy. Now, it was called the emergency levy, but it really acted the same as the general fund levy. That was capped at $0.27. Cents. Um, our other levies, like debt service, employee benefit levy, tort liability levy, those are capped at whatever your actual costs are. So in theory, they're on limited to whatever your uh, limits are. Um, but again, you know, you have to have a property um, insurance bill to pay to be able to use money out of that levy. Uh, you have to have an employee cost like health insurance. Right. So they are capped, but based on us going through the budget, you know, the, you know, you go back to this flexibility section, um, you know, we identified that for the liability property insurance, you know, we are funding basically 500, 554,000 out of our general fund for those costs. But there's always what your what I might what the basis of my question was, there's always been caps in terms of how much a city could increase their uh, property tax. Yes or no? Okay. Um, so when they put the caps on in late 2023, um, was this a dramatic change from pre previous caps? Good question. So PFM, I actually went back and reviewed the um, ratings agency call we had last summer uh, with PFM. And in it, they do a financial flexibility section. And at that point, we had $3.2 million of financial flexibility. Um, if you think about our 60 cent levy increase, that's taking about a million dollars of our financial flexibility. So about $1.80 or something. Yeah. Now, now we're left with 1.2. So we lost about a million dollars of financial flexibility under the, the house file that was passed last year. And again, I apologize for these remedial questions, but- They're my, great questions. They're I, really good questions. My, my next question is more, um, So I, I feel like um, our legislature has decided that property taxes are need to be managed in cities. And to do that, they have this uh, caps on levy, general fund levies. But then they're also taking away um, our ability to uh, raise taxes on properties because they, are, you know, the backfill. Uh, well, first they took they lowered 
they lowered the amount of taxes we could collect on commercial and they uh, made multifamily the same as residential, the same as single family residential. When they keep um, limiting how we can make our budgets, what is the ultimate goal? And I know that you, I'm, that that might not be a question that maybe that's not the question. Maybe it's like, what, what's the ideal city to keep up with expanding uh, growth, expanding staff, expanding uh, infrastructure needs? Is it, how are we supposed to manage? This is a very existential question, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to figure out where we're supposed to be getting the money to cover our budgets when it seems like the ways that we can uh, ask for money as a community we're we're here to say you know as a community we want a library we want roads we want public safety we want where are we supposed to get the money i mean i, I can't answer you know what they're thinking all but... of the legislature is you know one of the thoughts that i point to is when we look at the cost of city government the cost of city government in iowa is actually one of the lower costs of city government in the country. The, the, the biggest difference is in Iowa, we rely on property taxes, which is unusual. Uh, most states provide some level of local government aid uh, to their communities. And so when you look at other states, I mean, you could have cities that are receiving 30 to 40% of their actual general fund operational dollars. They're coming from basically shared revenues from the state. We don't get that in Iowa. And so while we rely on property taxes, yes, that makes <coughs> us look really bad in the realm of how much <coughs> property taxes. Um, but, you know, our cost of delivering those services are some of the lowest costs out there. So I, th I think that the legislature, if, if they would ever ask me my opinion, I think they really need to focus on first, what is the cost of the service? Are we very, are we outlandish, which I don't. Then you have to have the question of, well, then how do you want to fund the services that we're providing? Because I think we provide very critical services, everything from public safety to quality of life. I mean, if you decide, you know, we're going to eliminate quality of life, then, then you really become that question of, well, who's going to reside here? I mean, we're a country now where you're seeing a lot more ability to be mobile, to work remote. I know that's happening in my own household where you know people work from home now and if they don't have the amenities that they're attracted to in their communities i think that's going to drive our workforce outside the state of iowa so it, to me i think the question is how much is the the services are we are we outlandish i think i think the data shows that we're not and so then i think the question the legislature needs to ask how do you want to fund cities counties schools? well and as i understand it we're looking at an income uh getting rid of the what is it that they're trying to do get rid of the income tax yeah and then and and that's basically how our government is run the state government right yeah, i mean state so government, then where are they going to get their funding i, I think from that's, property taxes <laughs> i think the fear is like local option sales tax becomes attacked it'll go back to sales tax okay i'm sorry i'm off the subject but you know i was just like when you this whole presentation you've given so far has been very depressing, <laughs> just going to say. Um, is there any questions on what I've went or what, what's been added to board docs? Right, not board docs, but ClearGov. If not, the only other, the last piece of information I'll leave the council before you certainly can answer any questions. Um, there was a question of kind of what other cities are doing on levy rates. Um, haven't gotten a lot. There's still some are not as far along in the budget process as we are right now. Um, Ankeny's reported that they're too early to report. Altoona is saying they're gonna have no change in their levy rate. Um, Bond Durant is saying they're gonna decrease their levy rate by 42 cents. Five is reporting that they're gonna lower their levy rate by 22 cents. Norwalk is reporting they're planning no change. Uh, Urbandale's planning to go up seven cents and then walk, he's planning to go down. So that's the, the numbers I have right now. 
what I had compiled. So with that, I guess I'm happy to answer any questions council has. I, one question I had, Mike. I, I'm looking, trying to look through the ClearGov document. I was rem, seem to recall we had something in here that talked about our comparison between other metros on a per capita staffing level. But I'm having a hard time finding that. So that's under budget budget overview, property values and levy rate, and it's towards the bottom of this page. You're going to see comparable metro city only levy rates. And then the next set of char charts is a comparable metro consolidated levy rates. Uh, and this would be the fiscal year 2024 city only. And I don't think that answers your question. No, what I'm talking about is the per I'm talking about city employees, number of city employees per thousand population. That would be. I'm trying to remember. <coughs> So if you go under budget overview, there's personnel changes, five-year staffing plan. So I think this was a, a item that was in our staffing plan. I don't think it was really a budget document. Okay, so if you go down to that attachments. Yep. And so I think what you're referring to is kind of these tables in here. <coughs> Sorry. I don't know if it was a table, it was more. They State there of Iowa, is, similar size community is, staffing. Yeah, we'll look at page four, maybe, of that. Or 16. Page four talks about 17 communities, the the full-time employees per 1,000. No. Seven seven point five two employees per 1,000 is what we were trying to reach as far as an average, or if we were to reach that. See that on page four of that attachment? This page? When you said page four? No. At this page here, Brian? Yes. Overview of results. Yeah, let me see if it actually has a page number on it. I apologize. The bottom page of the page two, says yep. four, but it's, it's actually a, it's, page four in yeah. the document. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Tom. You're right. I think that's what you were referring to. Okay, yeah. I was just, I knew we had talked about this and I couldn't remember. I wanted to have that available, so thank you. It's been a while since we talked about this report, but yeah. Mike, uh, where does our, when we brought on the Grimes firefighters and, and related staff, where did that put us? overall just kind of raw ratios well we did we we excluded in this report we excluded we kind of used like the population of grimes and johnston and kind of split out grimes because it it's serving that community versus the johnston community so bringing them on would not have changed the okay. ratio. that's what i really wanted to know Mike, I, I have a question for you, um, and really I'll just cut to the chase. I'm very interested in hearing from others as to whether or not they have the appetite to increase the levy so that we could potentially bring on the three firefighters that were originally proposed in the staffing plan. But I want to hear from you from the standpoint of I don't want to do something that's ill-advised from the standpoint of we bring on these employees only to have to then riff them in very short order because our flexibility gets tied up and consumed um, by all of the other obligations really that are being forced and foisted upon us moving forward. So to some extent, if we were to do this today, um, we do, based on the numbers that you provided from a financial flexibility perspective, in other words, re relocating some of the costs related to benefits, related to tort liability, related to emergency management could go in separate levies. 
based on what you broke down per employee uh, and, and the amount that it would cost in order to do that, it looks like we could do that. Am, am I correct in that? In other words, we we could raise the levy so that we, or levies, I guess, because it's a domino effect, so that we could bring on approximately two thirds of three firefighters. Yes, I mean, there is flexibility in FY 2025 to do that. You know, the, the picture that I painted, it's a very conservative view because certainly when we, when I look at financial flexibility, it's a moment in time. It's today what's happening. We know that property values are going to increase. Um, and so that, that's going to give you more flexibility down the road. But we also know as property values increase, our costs of delivering services are going to increase. What is the next 30% increase in tort liability or uh, what's the next 30% increase in health insurance? Now, both of those have dedicated levies, but uh, again, what's that X factor of some other thing that has to come out of the operational fund? Um, you know, so certainly I, I always, you know, I always take it from a cautious view, um, but, you know, the council, you know, right now I, I said, looking forward, we have 16 and a half cents of financial flexibility beyond 2027 in the know of now, um, bringing those three positions on about 11 and a half cents of that. So, I mean, that's the cautionary note. Now, the next financial flexibility is you do have room if the council would so choose from a policy decision to, uh, I think we just lost maybe our room. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, but the, the the next concern becomes just, you know, what, what does the legislature do on property taxes? Do they, they take more flexibility? But, you know, again, one of the tools we have is the franchise fee. And so that does give you some level PC, some room. But eventually there, there's just concern about how do we navigate that? And again, I think we're today in a position where we are, uh, in a lot better position than a lot of other city councils and communities out there uh, because we do have that financial flexibility. And I think from my mindset is, you know, try to preserve that as much as we can. The reverse issue is we know that the, the calls for service and fire keep increasing um, and we're going to need to add firefighters at some point <coughs> in time. And so that's, that's the challenge. So Mike, if I were to say, um, other than other than the levy increase, where would you, if I, it, it, I'm giving you a hypothetical here, and I know I'm speaking on behalf of others, and, and I don't want, I, I want to disclaim that right away. But if the directive were given to you, we want to hire three firefighters, you cannot raise the levy. How are you going to do so? I mean, we would have to look at cutting services in other places. We don't have the financial reserves to impact that change. Um, now, fiscal year 2026, you know, I would suggest to council that we look at the franchise fee if levy is not palatable. Um, but again, if you say you can't, you still can't do the franchise fee again, then I'm going to say, um, we're going to have to look at level of service impacts. And I, what I hear from council is that's not a direction you want to go. So I think it's, it really, it, it becomes a difficult challenge. So, so I, I just also want to make sure, because I, I, I think you answered part of it, franchise fee cannot increase for this next budget year, but it could in FY26. The council makes that policy dis decision, yes, but it cannot increase for fiscal year 2025. The other place that I Without see... Without getting MidAmerican to agree to it. Sure, sure. I mean, there, obviously there's other effects. The, the other question I guess I have is we have uh, projected or proposed lost um, 
income and expenses, income exceeding expenses by approximately $500,000 to try to build up what I'm gonna call lost reserves um, in that regard. When lost was passed, we are allowed to be able to spend lost funds on public safety. Talk me through why it would not be a good idea. Why would it not be a good idea to use those lost funds to try to pay for those uh, fire personnel? I think, you know, the more we put into operational into lost, I think one of the you know, some others share this is lost is volatile. Um, it is very volatile in the sense that if we have a recession, people stop spending. And so unlike property taxes, which stays pretty calm, lost ebbs and flows pretty dramatically. And so I think from my perspective, the growth we've seen in lost has actually been pretty surprising coming from Carroll that had long-term history local option sales tax, we've seen very incremental growth. Um, we've seen pretty explosive growth over the last few years. And, and to me, that's pretty surprising. So I think there could be a point where we see a downturn in that. And so again, we build a reserve so that if we have ongoing operational cost, ongoing debt service obligations on a local option sales tax, you know, we can cushion those and hopefully withstand those changes. Uh, I think taking out of loss is, is, just becomes problematic from my viewpoint, but certainly that's a policy decision the council can make. Can you point me toward where in the budget book, uh, again, we get to see what currently you broke out that lot, those lost expenses, and then also what are, there's a spreadsheet that kind of gives that overview. All right, I think I, I think I found it, Mike. You, you gave me enough direction to be able to get there, so thank you. Please tell me this zoom is, you can zoom in on this. I don't, I don't see a way to do it. <laughs> Mike, that is one complaint. Uh, I really like uh, how you have this prepared, but those tables and charts without having a Zoom capability directly. Um, you can open up the PDFs and you can, so if you go all the way to the top of that screen. Um, the word says the word charts. Yep, you click that and it opens up the PDF version of them. Okay. So those are a lot more readable. We'll fix it for next year, but. That's the best we could do because I, I, I seen and realized that that was a problem that you couldn't really read them. Mike, while I'm on this, and then I, I promise I'll yield, Mayor, and others, but uh, I, I really appreciate all of you letting me ask these questions so I can get my brain further around this. And Mike, thanks for letting me put you on the spot, uh, literally. I, I'd say hot seat, but you're not sitting down, and, and don't, please, sit down uh, yet. Um, I, I do see that we project very little interest off of uh, local option sales tax. I know that one could, in fact, be you know the, the you know conservative in that regard. But can you explain why such a dramatic difference um, between our amended budget for this year and the twenty thousand dollars that we're reflecting for next year, when our balance is increased? I mean, it's just us. Interest rates are going to go back down, and so those gains in service. 
spending uh, we spend we're spending quite a bit in our amendments this, this year with the census money and the transfer to the fire department to our balance is down this year. Uh, it's just uh, always an estimate of time. Okay. I have just a couple of questions about this chart that's up there right now. And it, 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 so as I look at the chart and there was a chart earlier that broke out lost and then there was like police officer and yep. vehicles and all that stuff. That's not this chart. Correct. And what that chart is supposed to represent is when you look at this transfer of 1.8 million, that's how those dollars are going to be spent. So, so my question about this chart is so i'm looking at this year's the current budget and below so it says 2025 special census obligation which costs five hundred seventy nine thousand dollars, and then below it is an unmarked line that is 1.2 million dollars Okay. And I guess that's just, I mean, this is. I, I, I just forgot. So yeah, I mean, so it's, it's okay. It needs to be cleaned up just to have that on there because yeah. obviously we can't figure it out, let alone a, a citizen. Yeah. So then going back to the other chart, um, I, it would be helpful to me on the other chart, and I don't know if you can pull it up or not, but to break that out into ongoing and one time because it's all in one category. Yes, right there. So we, so it, to me, it's important, and, and I'm not proposing to change what we're doing with lost. All I'm proposing to do is have more information than I currently have. And this is better than what we were because this at least breaks out the 1.8 million. So I greatly appreciate that, but it, but it doesn't break it out into what is ongoing and what is one time. Now you can kind of guess, but I don't think us or our citizens should have to look at this document and guess. So um, that would be just a couple of thoughts I would have on laws. Um, I guess to, to Council Burkhardt's question about um, uh, willingness to support funding the additional three police officers, I would answer yes, I would. Um, and, I, and there's a couple of reasons why I, I say that. One is um, just looking at our overall staffing for the city, and that's one reason I wanted to, you know, pull up that master staffing report, which highlights the fact that we're 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 understaffed as a city, um, and our six point our number of FTEs per thousand is six point three, and compared to a seven point five for the rest of the metro area, so we're already understaffed, and we are, but we all, but we also value. The work that our staff does right and that's what we talk about all the time and not only do we value that our residents value that and i mean i don't i don't the number of things that i hear feedback from from residents uh is you know when compared to our taxes too high or my service is really awesome it is like a hundred to one that services are really awesome right so so that is what we have made a priority and but but all but we've made that a priority and we've gotten but we have not we don't have a, a staff base that I think can we can continue to perpetuate that into the future and I think that's really at risk and that's one reason why I think we made a strategic priority is here as a council that five year staff master staffing plan that that was a strategic priority that the city identified and so the staff went and and developed this five year master staffing plan. And in the first year included two police officers, three firefighters, an assistant city manager. And I, I'm really concerned that we're only funding that at about half the level. So what does that mean? So that means we now have to load that up into next year. And, um, and so now we have to hire six firefighters next year. 
in order to, to stay on track with our five-year master plan. And if we don't stay on track, it doesn't become a five-year master plan. It becomes a 10 or 15-year master, master <laughs> staffing plan. And I, I, I don't want to see that happen. So I want to stay true to that five-year master staffing plan. And in order to do that, we need to hire those. To me, uh, there's, there's two that we're leaving out right now, the city clerk and the three firefighters. I'm comfortable leaving out the city clerk position because I haven't really seen you know, information or data provided to why I think there's a compelling case for that. But I think Chief Clark made a, a very compelling case with that document that he distributed that's included now in our materials talking about the fact that um, we today we have a large percentage of calls where the one ambulance that we have and that we're able to staff with Johnston is already being out and in service and so that second or third call has to be serviced by an ambulance not from Johnston all right so two bad things are happening there one that high quality of service that our residents count on being provided by a Johnston person is not being provided by Johnston. And two, even the additional revenue that we generate by additional ambulance calls is not staying in Johnston. It's going to Urbandale or some other community that's providing an ambulance service. And so I think that if we add those three firefighters, we stay consistent with the five years master staffing plan, which I think is really important. We make continue to make progress on trying to get our staff ratios and what where they need to be, and we add staff that actually generate revenue for the city. So their 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 actual cost is somewhat offset by the fact that it gets. And if you look at that document that from from Chief Clark, I think his document indicated that he thinks that forty percent of those uh, uh, ambulance calls that today have to be staffed by Urbandale or some other community could be staffed by Johnston if we add those three firefighters. So I think that's a significant data point that for me makes a very compelling case for, um, uh, for adding the three firefighters. So that's kind of my, the, the first point. The second point, obviously, okay, the levy, right? And that's a legitimate concern. And I, and I respect those who are already, and I've expressed anxiety about a 60 cent levy increase. But I think it's really important to look at our levy, not just in a one year snapshot, but over a multiple year period going both backwards and forwards. Going backwards, we've gone through a period over the last five years where we, we have taken an action and the school board have taken an action that have reduced that combined property tax levy. It used to be about $41 per thousand in property. Now it's down to $34. And so we've made really good progress on that. And so I don't think a 60 cent or if we're looking at a <clears throat> potentially a 72 cent increase in the levy is going to significantly undermine that. And so we, I think that that's a, one of the benefits. Second of all, if we don't add these three firefighters this year and we're forced to then looking at it next year, we're facing a very significant budget challenge next year. And we don't, and next year, our revenue base is basically going to be the same as what it is this year. You don't get the revaluations. The rollback percentage actually goes up, which makes it a little bit harder to raise the levy. And then you're trying to implement all these additional staffing changes. So I, I think that in order to avoid a real financial problem next year and to be consistent with that five-year staff, master staffing plan, I support adding those three additional firefighters and taking the, the levy uh, increase from 60 cents to 72 cents um, in the, in the uh, budget. I, I will speak next. Uh, I am in support of this. Also, for all the reasons that Councilman Cope stated, uh, I think we all knew months ago that we were facing a significant challenge this year and that it would probably extend over multiple years. I agree that um, to try and offset the challenges we're going to have next year, we should take it on. We need to do what we can this year because uh, we're going to be back at this table next year and having the same conversations. Uh, so I'd rather hire those staff now.
I'm thinking out loud here, but um, <clears throat> I've been thinking out on this quite a bit. Yeah, I understand what Tom Cook says about we need the firefighters, we need to make, provide the right services and all of those things. I totally agree with that. But I'm also concerned that we already raised 60 cents levy and the, one of the highest in the metro already. And that's going to be a significant impact on each of the citizens of the city. And that will suddenly hurt their pocket. Now, can we increase 72 cents? I'm not sure. Do we really need three firefighters right away? Can we do a little bit better on that three firefighters and stuff three? Can we do two firefighters? Can we work through those things? I'm willing to consider that kind of a scenario. I would like to also see some data that hiring these two new firefighters, how much significant uh, services that we provide now without those, how much uh, how much revenue will we be saving and will those revenues saved will be part of that two new firefighters pay uh, compensation kind of thing. If there's a good data that I can actually look at, I think that could be a good way to look at it. But I'm not really very uh, in favor of raising the levy rates, just already raised about 60 cents. If we can make it a better, if we can get more data on that, trying to see that if I get two hires, well, that uh, how much that will significantly reduce the costs of the of the city that we are paying in the external vendors that we hire to get us things, or the um, over or uh, um, extra pay, extra pay they need to pay for the all right that they do, so. So data will help me more to define this new additions. So if like Suresh, I'm I am concerned about going above sixty cents. I think if we um, uh, don't think that there's going to be any reaction from our residents or from our businesses to the sixty cents, I think we're we're not giving them enough credit and we're under it. We're underestimating what the reaction is going to be. I think 60 cents is, 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 is gonna to be tough and every penny that we go above that is gonna be that much tougher. Having said that, uh, Mike, have we had a conversation with the fire board about the addition of three additional firefighters? We have not. I mean, we're gonna to have to have a discussion with the fire board um, and the city of Grimes. I mean, obviously- So we haven't even, we haven't talked to the city of Grimes either about funding their- we have, so originally we told the city of Grimes uh, this fall that we were planning to have three positions. At some point we had a discussion with the city of Grimes saying that no, we, at least I was not going to propose in my budget to council uh, three new positions. I have uh, told the city of Grimes through conversations I've had with council members that it will be a discussion point that certainly uh, will have to be had. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, options path forward, um, and th 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 let me start with your question, and there are some things I can follow up on Suresh. Um, you know, if the council, if the Johnson Council decided, you know, we want to include this in the budget, obviously the fire board is going to have to concur. You know, we are still in the early preliminary parts of the budget, so we go through the budget process. We will have to go to the fire board. We're working to schedule a fire board meeting. Now they're going to have to have a discussion, set a preliminary budget, and then they're going to need a file to have a public hearing on the budget itself at the fire board level before the, the budget itself will be approved from the fire board. Uh, in all of that, uh, the city of uh, Johnston and Grimes will have a, a decision point on budget budgeting for those new positions. Uh, and if a decision is made not to proceed at the fire board level, you know, that can be pulled out before we we finalize our our levy rate itself. We're not going to have to uh, finalize that till uh, April 15th is when we will take our last action. So we do have some time um, and we'll have the whole fire board budgeting process go through. Uh, remember, when you set the levies, that is the maximum. Um, when you take your final vote and actions, you can always lower the levy rate. Does that answer your question? It, it does. Let me take on just a little bit more of a question. And sorry, Suresh. Sure, fine, go ahead. Um, 
if we hire these three firefighters, what additional costs will there be? Do, is there additional equipment, additional training, another ambulance? Uh, what, what are the other associated costs with hiring these three firefighters? Just so we know what the, what the total cost would be. I'll, I'll attempt to answer this first, but I'll probably defer to the chief as he walks up here. But, uh, you know, wouldn't need a new ambulance. We, we have the resource for that. Um, but certainly there's going to be, we're going to have to outfit the new equipment like we would any new recruit. Uh, there's going to be some training if they come in as paramedics, like with the budgets anticipating we'd have uh, two paramedics, one EMT. Certainly there's going to be just internal training. Uh, unlike the police department, uh, you know, we don't send people generally through the academy. They come with some level of licensure. Uh, now, the EMT, eventually, we're going to want to get it programmed in so that we uh, get that individual up to a paramedic level. Um, so that will be a training core, training cost, but that's going to be more long-term, not year one. Um, so... <clears throat> It's a good question. So the the money that's projected would just be for their wages and their benefits. But <clears throat> as Mike said, it would not increase the the fleet. We would not need another ambulance. Um, but there would be some additional uh, training and uniforms and some of that. But most of that would is already kind of programmed into our budget each year. So there wouldn't be a huge ask on top of that. Thank you. Um, kind of stretches and maybe the chief wants to walk back up here quick. Um, but the kind of your question, you know, data points, um, you know, our personnel costs for the ambulance division is about $3.6 million. Our revenues that we're receiving, you know, it, that shows up here in the budget is about a million. So even adding more staff and we pick up a few more calls, it's certainly not going to be a cost neutral. There will be costs. We certainly will pick up a little bit more revenue, um, but by far it's going to be probably 15% of the cost will be reimbursed through insurance and, and the transportation. I don't, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, the, the additional revenue would certainly not offset additional costs as Mike said we may gain an, a, an additional 10 to 15 percent but that would be about it as far as that additional cost so <clears throat> so that when, when, it's kind of confusing so when we talk three firefighters the way the budget is figured approximately two of those three would be the Johnston coming out of the Johnston general fund and then the other one would be coming out of the grimes based on the formula that funds the fire board or that <clears throat> that the fire board sets <laughs> that funds the fire district budget so that's why and when we have three shifts we need to have one on each shift so that it balances out and so when we talk about <clears throat> the additional staffing it takes six to staff an ambulance if we were to add six more people we could staff that ambulance pretty much 24 seven, uh, 365 minus when they're gone. And that's when they, we have a staffing factor. So the 40% that I described in there, <clears throat> I looked at the calendar for a one year and said, well, how many times do we have one person off? And so that additional person off would be covered by those three firefighters. And that equated to about 40% of the time when we would have a second staffed ambulance and a fire engine in that station so right now we go back and forth if nobody's on vacation or sick then we can have an engine and an ambulance in the two outside stations and an engine in the middle but as soon as one person's gone then we drop from five to four people in those stations and then two people are gone then we drop <clears throat> drop down to three and so that's where we're saying if we get the additional person that would buffer about 40% of that time when we would be able to staff that ambulance with two people. Right. And he said, he said we need three people. So that's two people is from Johnston, one is from Grimes. Is that correct? My yep, understanding. Pretty much within a few dollars of that percentage. And for those two additional full time employees, we need to raise our levy by 12 cents. 
approximately 11 and a half cents, yes. And that, that's our share. You know, Grimes is gonna contribute their share to. Right, do we, do we know if Grimes is willing to add out that one additional? And that's what we, that's what Mike was talking about. We haven't fully had that discussion. We did early and then when it looked like we were settling around that 60 cents, then they were told, yeah, we're probably not going to add the firefighters. And so that would have to be a fire board discussion, which we have a meeting scheduled for the 21st. And if we are gonna have that discussion, then we'd have to set public hearing that meeting and then have a vote on it later. I guess I will, I need more information from the fire board as well. Let's have that meeting and then we can make that decision of two or three or none. I know we have guests at seven, so um, I'd well, like to I, I think, I'd like to continue a little bit of discussion on the. Mike, can you just real quickly in the few minutes that we have left, can you just remind us what the process is going forward? Yeah, so uh, broadly, we're going to need to settle by the next meeting where we want on the levy rate. Um, tonight, I would hope you know we could break the work session, maybe pick some discussion up at the end of the regular council meeting, but I need some direction if there's some data points you need, what information you all need to make a decision. Because at our next meeting is we're really gonna need direction on what you want for levy rate. Because then on uh, the March 4th, uh, the council is gonna need to adopt a resolution setting the levy that then kicks off a public notice that's gonna be mailed by Polk County that's new this year. Uh, that will hit the mailbox. Polk County has to send it out by March 20th. Um, and then April 1st, you're going to have during the work session, a public hearing on the proposed levy rate itself. You will hold a public hearing. You will actually take no action at the public hearing. You're just simply receiving information. If that public meeting lasts five minutes, great. That's the end of the meeting. You'll have to have at least a 15 minute break then. And then we can go into another meeting, but it has to be a separate independent meeting. Um, by the way, they do recommend that you keep the meeting open and available for the public in case someone's running late for about 15 minutes, but you can only take action on that one item. Um, you, will you will take action um, at your regular meeting then on April 1st. So at seven o'clock, um, the council will receive, finalize and adopt the final proposed operating and capital improvement um, budget and then order public hearing. Um, we will publish public hearing on April 4th and the council will then will hold their regular public hearing and adopt it at the April 15th meeting. Uh, so we have that extra public hearing before that's a, that new mailing that's going out. That me and I, you know, live in this jargon, um, but but that that's kind of the process laying out. So Mike, I would just ask that you send that, that timeline to us in an email so we have that in front of us. I know that there was a calendar previously provided, but I'm not sure I know where mine is anymore. So if you <laughs> we're just happy to send it out. <laughs> send it again. That would be helpful. So if we could continue, I'd like to, if we could, if indulge me, continue the workshop to the end of the meeting so we can just wrap up a little bit of this discussion tonight. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh, we are almost at 7 o'clock, so let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting.